Well, guys, do I have a doozy for you today? When you think of female serial killer, who do you think of? Are you thinking about her? That's probably, if I had to pick, that's probably kind of typically who I would lean towards. But I came across this one by chance, so I've never heard of her. You need to let me know if you've ever heard of her. And if not, let me know what you think of her. She's kind of actually one of the first female serial killers, I think, if you kind of go back. And she's actually one of the first serial killers, but we can talk about that later. So yeah, enjoy. Henora Kelly was born on March 31st, 1854 in Boston, Massachusetts. Like a lot of people in Boston, her parents were Irish immigrants, Bridget and Peter. Bridget Kelly, isn't that like one of the most Irish names you could ever hear of? And so she was the youngest of four girls. Sadly, her mom would die of TB when she was only one. Her dad, who was called Kelly the Crackpot, I think he was already a bit kind of mad. Like I, I did see him kind of being described as a bit eccentric. And I think I read kind of that he was a bit abusive. But anyway, obviously he didn't cope well after the loss of his wife. And so he would go on to surrender six-year-old Tenora and her sister, eight-year-old Delia, to the Boston Female Asylum. After this, whether it was from shame or guilt, or it was just kind of the last, you know, the last straw in a lot of tragedy, Peter, who was a tailor, sewed his own eyes shut. It was said that Delia would go on then to be a prostitute. An older sister, Nellie, would end up being committed to an insane, insane asylum. So there was just not a great track record for any of the daughters in the family. I actually don't know about the fourth one. I've never found anything about her. I have read that in 1862 and then in 1864, so either she was eight or she was 10, that Honora was adopted by a woman called Anne C. Toppin. Now, when I say adopted, I use that term loosely. Anne basically just wanted uh, like a little mini servant for free. And so it's also called then like an indentured servant. But I don't know if that was actual a thing or if it was kind of like she adopted her. And then it was kind of like, oh, well, did you know what I've done for you? And now you have to help me by paying me back by working. Anne liked Honora because when Honora were, was in the asylum, as they call it, a female asylum, she liked getting praise for doing things. So she done things, you know, she would help clean, she would help do this, that, because she liked getting pr the praise and the attention. And so it was kind of like an easy pick for Anne. However, she wouldn't get any praise or anything in the house. She was basically just forced to do all the cooking and the cleaning and stuff like that. She would insist calling her auntie. She would insist on Honora changing her name. So the um, like the Irish immigrants at the time had like a lot of people thought like they were like you know drunks and all this other kind of racist stereotypes. She didn't want that kind of to be associated with her family. So she changed her name from Honora Kelly to Jane Toppin. And I did read that it was like she would tell people that the reason she had her like was kind of because oh her father worked away and you know all this stuff and then like if that's true I think that's where Jane got it from Honora because Jane would go on to be saying like that her dad you know worked over in China or he worked in Italy and stuff like this and then she would say like her sister married this wealthy you know um British person or stuff like that so I believe like that's where the beginning of the lies came from it was from Anne Jane did tell lies. She told a lot of those type of fibs. Anne's daughter, Elizabeth, she had her as like a friend and as a sister. And it is it is said that like Elizabeth considered Jane her sister and her close friend. Maybe because of all like these lies and stuff she told, Jane was actually quite popular in school. And then when she turned 18 and she had graduated from Lowell High School, it was like her debt was cleared then. Um, and then they gave her 50 like dollars as kind of like a, a present or a thank you for all of this which obviously nowadays would be a lot more money like it was you know 50 dollars was a lot but it's just weird that like oh you've cleared off your debt with us now after me adopting you so she kind of continued on there anyway helping and again I don't know at that point was she actually being paid to do it or was it nearly kind of just 
that's what she had been raised to do then. But like even when Anne died then, she prepared her body for, you know, for the funeral and stuff. Anne didn't even leave her anything in the will. Jane would go on actually to then serve Elizabeth, who had gone on, you know, who would take over the house. And then she got married. So her husband, RML, it is said that Jane fancied him, but that she didn't kind of really understand that she was flirting and she would flirt in front of Elizabeth. So this, I think, caused some tensions in the house. And maybe then it was just time for Jane to move on. The whole thing with Anne, like making her tell, tell lies and all of this stuff, right, and keep up with all this. Jane hid her identity so much that she would make anti-Irish remarks about people, you know, to keep up this charade, basically. Or the charade, if you fancy. So in 1885, Jane decided to go to learn and tra like train as a nurse. And so she went to the Cambridge School of Nursing. And here, with like patients and stuff, she was very happy and she was very, you know, nice and polite and everybody loved her. And so this is where she got the nickname, Jolly Jane. Even though she grew up, her behaviour still changed. Her behaviour still continued. She still told lies. In fact, she would frame or lie about her roommates in the, in, you know, in the college and say that they had been drinking and that they were like, you know, sleeping with men or, you know, chatting to men or whatever it was at the time that you could be considered a sin for. And so she got kicked out. And yeah, just stuff like that. She would kind of steal, she would lie, all of this. She liked working the night shift because it kind of meant like there was it was quieter, she would say, but it also meant there was less eyes on you. And it was commented that she seemed to really like performing autopsies, which they said was a bit unusual. Although I find that a bit unusual that a nurse is performing the autopsy in the first place. She would often be caught in the medicine cabinet. And so she started to like experimenting with the medications and she would use her patients as the guinea pigs. So she would mix things like morphine and atropine. And here she would kill at least two patients using these mixtures, these concoctions. Later, Jane would say that she got an erotic thrill from watching her patients die. She would say it was, quote, a voluptuous delight. In 1889, she was, you know, trained and all. She's kind of in her mid-30s at this point. And she moved to Massachusetts General Hospital. So this was like a very prestigious hospital. And again, well-liked by patients, well-liked by all the, the doctors. So it was like, you know, it was a big thing. Unfortunately, she would be caught stealing. And so she was let go. But she was let go with, like, lots of doctors referrals, you know, references. So she actually then went private. So she would, you know, go and stay with someone in their home and look after them, this type of thing. And this is, she got this because of, like, the doctor's referrals. And at the time, a woman, like, a, a female nurse would have been earning, like, $5 a week. She was earning $25 a week because she was getting all these, like, these wealthy clients because the doctors were recommending her. In 1887, a patient, Amelia Finning, would say that Jane had given her a medicine. And she said it tasted very bitter and she took it. But that she felt then that she started to lose consciousness. And she remembers Jane getting into the bed with her and, like, holding her and kissing her and stuff. And she would say that something must have startled Jane because she got it, she jumped and got out of the bed and then that was it. And that she she just thought this was a dream, obviously, until later when everything came out. Jane basically said that there was, quote, no use keeping old people alive. And so it was, it was always kind of like old people that she was poisoning. So we know that she had killed at least two in the first hospital and then obviously went on to kill more in the second hospital and then let go. Funnily enough, wasn't let go for that. She was let go for stealing and I think she was like messing up with, you know, she was making up stuff in the charts and stuff. In 1895, Jane would go on to kill her landlord, Israel Dunham and his wife. I don't know, was this simply because like they were looking for the rent or did she just want to do it and they were obviously maybe an easier pick or an easier target if again like they were old and then in august 1899 
Elizabeth was suffering from um, depression. They, they call it like mel melancholia, is that a word? But anyway, so she was talking to Jane and Jane at this time was staying in Buzzards Bay in Cotomet, Cotomet. And so she invited Elizabeth down, you know, um, kind of get away and this and that. And so RML was like, yeah, that's a great idea because you're feeling so low and stuff, so go. And so she was staying there. And so they went out for a picnic. And like it said, like they were having a lovely time. Obviously, people must have seen them and stuff. They had a picnic and they were out by the like the river or the lake or whatever. And it says then at this point that Elizabeth doesn't feel well. So I don't know if it's that she has already been poisoned or was she just not feeling well like that if she was you know suffering with depression and stuff maybe she was maybe it was just too much for her and they got back and then so one source says that it was nearly like Elizabeth obviously just kind of still thought of Jane as like the servant and asked her to fetch her some water so she brought her sister the concoction the drink with her little extra in it and it is said that she then sat there by her sister's side while she was in bed and that when she started to like lose consciousness she got into the bed with her and held her in her arms while she died so that she could feel the life leave her. so they're kind of implying that maybe it was this moment that it was kind of like i'm not your effing servant kind of thing and that's why she decided to poison her i kind of feel she probably just decided to poison her anyway and this purely may also be because Jane fancied RML, RML, and thought by doing that that, you know, she could move in on the turf. And then she decided to kill, I don't know why I'm smiling, she decided to kill then uh, the housekeeper in their home, 77-year-old Edna Bannister. And again, this was nearly so like oh because she might move in on the turf i'm sure 77 uh, 77 year old edna had other things on her mind so then she offers them to kind of be like the cleaner in the hopes that then she'll be in the home and all this and like armel has no interest so he's like no then she decides to poison him so that she could nurse him back to health this didn't work so i don't know if it means the poisoning didn't work or that she poisoned him nursed him back to health and he still wouldn't be with her and then she threatened to tell everybody that he got her pregnant. Um, so it was at this point then that he like demanded she leave and though she left. So in Cotomet or Buzzers Bay, she was staying in the Jackin Hotel or the Jackson Hotel. Jackson sounds a bit nicer, doesn't it? And so she would like rent out rooms here and stuff. And the hotel was owned by Alden Davis and his wife. Now his wife has been called Mary and she has also been called Matty. And they lived on what is now called Mystery Lane. So it said that she would like, Jane would just like set fires in her hotel room and then like wake up to the fire. I don't know, again, like was this just a bit of an attention thing? Or I don't know what she was trying to do. So then on the 4th of July, 1901, Mary or Matty went to Jane to collect like the rent that was due and while there jane made her a lovely little drink of morphine and like sparkling water or something i don't know how you would notice what that is but anyway she dies but mary slash maddie was a diabetic and so jane basically says that she ate cake she ate a slice of cake and died and everyone believed her jane then moved into the home you know to look after alden and the rest of the family and then their two daughters were Minnie and Genevieve. And so then Genevieve died. And again, she had a history of like heart disease. And so Jane was able to put it down to this. So basically what happened was even in the hospitals, she obviously, like the patients were obviously in hospital for a reason anyway. And so she kind of used that to her advantage. So she would use people that it was able to then kind of be swept under the rug because it would be like, oh yeah, but they had a heart problem or they had this or they had that or whatever. So Genevieve dies and nothing's really said still. And then Alden dies and Jane says it was from a broken heart. And then still nothing. It's still like, oh, three family, three out of four of the family members have now died. The third one is only from like, oh, broken heart because his wife and daughter died. Minnie died from morphine poisoning. And 
one of the sources actually says that in total seven members out of this family die but I don't know what the other ones are listed but it says that it was the Davis slash Gibbs family so I don't know what their names are but in total she is supposed to have killed seven out of this family. Ninny's husband and his father aren't really buying the whole like oh what did she die of um I don't know let me see they were like no this is too weird like that she you know so many of them have died she, Minnie maybe she was healthy and they were like no so they got her body exhumed and they had toxicology tests done and so it showed that there were high levels of morphine in her blood and so on the 29th of October 1901 Johnny Jane Toppin was arrested in Amherst New Hampshire there were 12 deaths confirmed that were attributed to her poisoning them she would confess to 31 and the authorities suspected there could have been a hundred or more it is said what was things say that she never killed kids now i don't know if that was a conscious choice or obviously that would just bring more attention to her at least we can say at least we can say no kids died in this situation so the trial is interesting so the trial goes ahead in 1902 and one of Jane's arguments is she basically calls herself like an incel, you know, like I don't, I didn't realize that for ages. An incel, you know, like the dweebs, they are, they're, they're basically called like an involuntary, involuntarily celibate. So you're an incel, but like it's not your choice. You want to be out there having sex and relationships and all, but it's so for mostly typically it's men who do, who are like that so it's like oh the women don't like me they only want you know these big burly men and blah 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 so she was basically doing this she was like a female incel and she basically said quote if i had been married i probably wouldn't have killed all those people i would have had my husband and kids to take up my time basically jane was hoping that she would be found guilty like just standard guilty because then obviously she thought there was a chance then that she'd get out but that if she was found insane or you know like not guilty by insane by reason of insanity she would be committed and that she'd never get out so her argument was strong that she was like was like no i'm not i'm not insane so three doctors would find her morally insane and this was due to <laughs> sorry this was due to her like necrophiliac tendencies you know that she would like to get into the bed and hold them and all this and because she preferred coffee for breakfast i just feel personally attacked right now in regards to the morally insane she would say i can read and have no bad thoughts so i don't know where moral degeneracy is coming from she never showed guilt she never showed remorse this is a quote from jane no voice has as much melody as the one crying for life no eyes as bright as those about to become fixed and glassy no face so beautiful as the one pulseless and cold it nearly sounds a bit poetic if it wasn't so effed up the trial only lasted eight hours and the jury only had to deliberate for 27 minutes until they found jolly jane Toppin not guilty by reason of insanity she was then committed to the taunton insane asylum when she first went she refused to eat out of fear that her food had been poisoned so when other patients would be sick jane would say to like one of the nurses like to go get the morphine <laughs> and quote get some morphine dearie you and i will have a lot of fun seeing them die you just can't stop her you can't stop her she then died on august 17th 1938 which says she was 80 i think but um i've also read 84 and 87 so then but that's the only date of birth i've date of birth i've seen so i'd have to go with 80. sorry the light has just gotten starting to get very dark so so i'd like to start to get a bit dark so i've just had to fix my lighting a little jolly jane obviously caused it was like a huge media sensation because like that there weren't it wasn't like serial killers hadn't been around long and then like a female serial killer it's like what now there was one before her i think that i saw was like lavinia or something but it's funny right because um if you look up like the first female serial killer or who's the most famous female serial killer eileen warnos comes up eileen warnos was in like the 80s into the 90s i think 
so that's why I was like oh is this who you think it is like it's mad like that is kind of who people think like when they first think of because you don't think of a lot of serial killers who are female even then it's funny because H.H. H. Holmes he was active from 1891 to 94 he was later than Jane and he was even later than Jack the Ripper. But everybody always says like, oh, the first ser like the first modern day serial killer in that sense was H.H. H. Holmes. But he wasn't. He just obviously had a very good media campaign. Anyway, I didn't know about Jane and, or Honore, if we were to go by Honore. I don't know, you can nearly even argue that it was when she became Jane that that's when this all happened. I don't know. Anyway. Let me know what you think of this case and if you did know about it. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not hugely into all the serial killers. They're not really my interest, my main topic of interest. Um, but yeah, obviously some of them are a bit mad. I'm not, do you know what? I'm not into the whole frenzy and like huge kind of thing people put, some people put on serial killers like i'd be in i'd be on i think i've said it before i'd be on like facebook true crime facebook pages and stuff and most people are cool and sound but then you have people being like oh look at like my new like wallpaper or look at like my new um living area and it's like decorated with stuff from like bundy and dharma and all this and like i like that's just weird i don't know what you're doing <laughs> with your life um yeah okay i'm finished judging people okay anyway thank you very much we won't keep wabbering on i was trying to do jabbering on like the last video and i shall see you in the next video thanks bye